Romero. Uh, the title of, um, of, the, of this talk is Data Simulation by Neural Networks on Notion Circulation Model. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Olmo Zavala, Zavala Romero. Uh, he's a, a research scientist at Center of uh, Ocean Atmospheric Prediction Studies, co-ops from Florida State University. His research area include applied machine learning in earth science, Lagrangian analysis of physical oceanographic phenomena and geospatial geospatial data analysis and visualization too. Ongoing research projects include deep learning for ocean data simulation, Lagrangian model to estimate source and destinations of marine debris in the Caribbean and efficient visualization of Lagrangian data sets to the web. Uh, he is working on applied deep learning methods to oceanography. Uh, Dr. Olmo, thank you a lot for your uh, accept our invitation to be here. And then please feel free to feel free to to start your presentation now. Thank you again. You can start your presentation when you when you're ready. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, sure. Okay, let's see because uh, I'm using my phone as a microphone for some reason. I was not um, the computer microphone was not working. Okay, so thank you, Harold, for the um, uh, introduction and also for the invitation. I'm very happy to be part of uh, this um, short course on data simulation. Uh, I'm gonna spend like one minute for a personal introduction. I'm from Mexico. Uh, these two kids are my life now. Uh, before having kids, I like sports and being outdoor. And my uh, background is mostly on scientific computing and computer science. And after my PhD, I wandered between uh, Mexico City at the UNAM and then University of Miami. And in 2019, I came to the Center for Ocean and Atmospheric Prediction Studies. As Haroldo mentioned, my research is mostly in uh, applied machine learning, which I have done it uh, on medical imaging. In this image, I see, uh, we have a segmentation of prostate uh, from magnetic resonance images. Also on the earth sciences, here we have an estimation of uh, salinity and temperature profiles from the ocean surface. Uh, and I have also done some Lagrangian modeling and scientific visualization on the web. And as you can see, compared with uh, previous presentations, my, my experience on data simulation is only on the last couple of years. So I think my contribution for this uh, course should be focused more on the machine learning part also because tomorrow uh, there are going to be several presentations that are using uh, neural networks uh, in one way or another one for data simulation. The way I, sp I split this presentation is I'm going to give you an introduction into neural networks and convolutional neural networks. That's gonna be like half of the presentation. And after that, I'm going to come back to the, to the data simulation area and how we use CNNs on ocean circulation models. So let's start with the very basics and then we are going to move fast. Um, the initial model of an artificial neuron came from a, um, um, came from the, the initial knowledge of the biology cell at that point. Uh, and what we had is a nucleus of the cell that it connects through dendrites to other uh, neurons. And then the output of the uh, neuron has what is called the axon and it can connect to other neurons.
And the initial model of this neuron, which still use a lot, um, what is done, what is, if it has a weighted summation of the inputs, and that weight uh, is telling you how strong the connection is with other neurons, and then it has uh, an activation function G. The equation for a single neuron is this one, I just a weighted summation, and this weight is what, uh, what the network or the single neuron will learn. And then it also has a, a bias that we will not represent here in this diagram, but that bias is also part of the equation. The activation functions that we use, there are many. Uh, initially, the sigmoid function was um, heavily used because we wanted to mimic, again, the biological function of the neuron. So we wanted to decide if the neuron is going to spike or not. But nowadays, we have many different activation functions that we can use. And I decided to give you a couple of examples, uh, go into those examples also. The simplest I, uh, example that I can come up with is just uh, if we want to generate a linear model, right? So we have this uh, synthetic data and we want to learn the weights of a single neuron. If we only have one input, a single neuron will, con will have two weights, right? Weight one and weight two, weight two will be the bias. And the activation function, because it's linear, we don't need anything, we can use the identity. And then the loss function that we want is just a function that can tell us how good our model is. In this case, we are using a mean square error, but there are also uh, many other loss functions that can be created. How do neural networks learn uh, these weights? Well, there are all based on uh, different flavors of gradient descent. But what we do is we initialize our weights or all the parameters of our, our network uh, randomly. Then we compute the loss function that we tell you us how good our model is. And then we obtain the gradients of those weights with respect to our loss function. Uh, uh, modern libraries of machine learning uh, obtain these gradients using the backpropagation method. And it's already there. We don't have to to implement it every time. That's why uh, it has been a boom of uh, machine learning methods in many different areas. And finally, once we have that gradient, we modify the weights um, into the direction of the um, opposite to the gradient, and then we compute the loss uh, function again. And that's how we can modify the weights uh, iteratively. So let's let's go with a. The simplest examples, the two examples that I'm going to show you are made on uh, PyTorch. The two main machine learning libraries available right now is TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch. And even though I, I'm, I have more expertise in TensorFlow, the academic uh, research uh, groups are using uh, mostly PyTorch because of, um, because of several reasons. Um, it's more, uh, is, um, so so the, the examples I'm going to show you are in Python. So the first type part is just the imports. And then the second part here is just how we generate our synthetic example, right? Just a linear function with some noise. And this is how in part of PyTorch we define our model. So this is the line that matters. We are just going to generate a single linear um, uh, CNN layer with uh, one input and um, one neuron. And then all this part is just to uh, plot how the model is. Because we initialize our weights uh, randomly, if we run this section multiple times, you will see that the model that is being um, applied is, uh, it can generate different, different uh, lines. The second step is we generate the loss function. As I mentioned before, we are using the mean square error. And then the flavor of gradient descent that we are using is a stochastic gradient descent. And then these are the steps of modifying the weights of the neural net. We first execute the model with our uh, observations or with our examples. Then we obtain the loss function of the current model. We initialize our 
all the gradients to zero. And then here is the part that is doing the back propagation that is computing the gradient with respect of um, the gradient of all the weights with respect to the loss function. And then here we modify the, the weights of our single neuron. And you can see here, it's a very simple example the how we can learn a linear model without just a single neuron. And that um, those steps are the same for uh, much more complex um, neural networks. What we are mostly changing is our flavor of the architecture of the neural uh, network and also the loss function that we are using. Our second and last example for uh, our toys neural networks is gonna be this one, where we have a function that is not linear. And now we are going to show you how we can model uh, non-linearities by incorporating hidden layers that have uh, simple non-linear activation functions. I'm going to show you two cases, one where we have a single hidden layer and one where we have multiple hidden layers. And if we think about it, the function that the neural network is computing, if we just have a single layer, is almost, again, almost linear. We only have, let's say, two steps of non-linearity that occur one on the first hidden layer and one on the output um, neuron. So let's test our second example. Again, the first part is just the imports of the library. Here we generate uh, our synthetic data. And here are the three models that we are going to test. The first one is a linear one, the same one that we already used. The second one has a single hidden layer with 20 neurons and one output layer, exactly one of the images that I will show you. And the last example has two hidden layers with 10 neurons for those uh, hidden layers. Uh, what we, if we use the linear model of a single uh, neuron, of course, the model is going to be aligned and it's going, it won't be, uh, it won't represent our data correctly. If we use our second uh, model, which is, uh, this one is a single intermediate, in a single hidden layer with 20 neurons, which is a little bit uh, nonlinear. We can already see here, this is the model with our uh, weights randomly uh, initialized. And after the training is happening, uh, it does approximate our data, but uh, because our uh, network is almost uh, linear or the nonlinearity is very small, we are not able to represent the data correctly. Finally, if we, Test, if we test our final model that has um, two hidden layers and 10 uh, neurons on that, uh, on each hidden layer, we have increased the nonlinearity of the network. And in that case, uh, the model approximates our data much better. And what happens if we increase the complexity of our model? Well, what that will create, if, for example, we create, uh, let's say, 20 hidden layers with 50 neurons in each one. Here, the number of total parameters is already a lot, like 51,000, as you can see here. And the model, the, the network will still try to approximate the observations, but in this case, uh, is what uh, we can see here, what is being called the uh, overfitting, right? So we are overfitting our data and any other points that we, we haven't seen on our observation or in our examples won't be model correct. So here again, the two notes that I want to talk about 
regarding uh, neural networks that I didn't show in those examples. One is data normalization. If you imagine that we have two inputs rather than one, but the range of those inputs is very different. For example, we have input one that ranges from zero to one and input two that goes from zero to let's say 10 to the five. If we do not normalize our data, the training process is much slower basically because the, um, if, we, if we imagine the surface of the loss function that we are uh, minimizing, it, it gets like a very elongated into the direction of the largest range. So it is very important to normalize our data, even though I'm not doing that in our two examples that I'm showing. And the second one that I talk about a little bit is the generalization. Okay? Um, right now, I'm using all our training examples for doing the, the training of the network. But in that case, um, I cannot control or I cannot um, predict how well the model is going to generalize when we have different examples. And the proper way to do it is uh, you split your uh, training set or your training examples into three different sets. One is the training set, the second one is the validation one, validation sets, and the third one is the test set. And the train set is the one that is used to modify the weights of the network, is the one that is used uh, where we compute the gradients and we modify the weights and we do the learning of the network. But the validation one is, is used to decide when to stop the training. If we continue just uh, iterating into the learning of the network, the model will get more and more approximated into the observation, depending how complex the model is. So what we have here in this plot is time, the number of epochs that the network is used for training, and here on y is the error of the model. So in, in every epoch, we are going to obtain the error of the training set, and at the same time, the error on the validation set. Remember, the validation set is not used to modify the weights of our network. Uh, we want to stop the learning when the validation error is the smallest one, right? Once the validation error starts increasing again, uh, is because we are going to have some overfitting on new data. And finally, the test set is used to really estimate how well the network is going to perform with newer examples. So that was like a very fast introduction into neural networks. But now, the, all the two examples that I show you were using just a single input for the network, but if we think about images and we want to do, perform some type of analysis or modeling that uses an image as an input, or for example, um, if we consider a single field of an ocean model, like temperature, what we have here is um, temperature in the Gulf of Mexico, this is Florida, and this is uh, Yucatan in Mexico. We can consider it also as an image, but every single grid point or every single uh, pixel in the image corresponds to one uh, input uh, data, input uh, field right, or input variable. So for a very small image of uh, size 100 by 100, we will have uh, 10 to the four inputs. And if we wanted to compute something that also outputs uh, an image of the same size, they say 100 by 100, uh, following the same architecture that I show you on the previous examples where the neurons are connected to all the newers on the previous uh, layer, uh, we will have 10 to the 8 uh, weights or parameters by just having a single uh, layer. So that that's, uh, won't be possible to, to perform uh, computationally. And that's where the, the idea of uh, convolutional neural networks arise. It takes into account two things. One is that it assumes the, the 
correlations between pixels are uh, specially uh, correlated. And it also tries to reduce the number of weights by uh, sharing the weights between the whole image. So now, rather than um, aligning or neurons uh, like, a, like in a single layer, we consider the relation, the, the spatial setup of an image, which is a 2 a 2D matrix. And now the weights that we have in this example is a um, three by three kernel with nine weights. Those nine weights are shared within all our um, image. And the equation that is computed by, by that uh, kernel is the one that we have right here. And this idea of filters, I mean, has been there for many years in the computer uh, vision group. Those filters uh, have been used for, for, to solve uh, many problems. A classic one that you will uh, learn on a computer vision class is the Sobel filter that obtains, is basically obtaining the derivative, vertical and horizontal derivatives of an image, but you can combine it to detect edges on an image. So if we apply this filter to this image, we obtain the, the following output. And similarly, you can obtain um, the following output if we use the second uh, filter. It's only obtaining um, edges from the from the image, and there are also other filters like this one, the mean filter that is used to smooth or blur the um, an image. So a final note on filters is that um, even though the examples that I'm going to show you right now consider uh, an image with a single band, images are commonly uh, uh, um, photographies that we take are a composite of uh, three bands, the RGB, red, green, and blue bands. And the proper equation of a uh, CNN is the one that I show you, it convolves the kernel from each of the bands of the image, R, G, and B, and then it adds them together, okay? So a complete uh, equation of a single um, layer is the, is the following. So now I try to create, again, a super basic uh, Hello World example on how we can learn this type of filters using uh, convolutional neural networks. And what I, uh, what I did to, in this example is I generate synthetic images, which is a combination of uh, sines and cosines. And from that, from those images, I compute the Sobel filter and I use that as an output to train our network. Again, we know that for this simplistic example, a single kernel should be enough to approximate this relationship between the input image and the output image. And the loss function is the same as before. We are going to minimize the, the error or the difference between the output, the image generated by the network. So let's see. These are only the input. Uh, here is where we generate the synthetic um, kernel. Here I'm just showing you an example of uh, what can we obtain if we combine the output of those two filters. So this is the solver filter on the vertical. This is the solver filter on the horizontal. We, here we do the convolution of those two filters with respect to the input image. And here I'm just showing you the, the uh, sum of the absolute value, the absolute value of the sum of those two filters. And this is the, the output that you generate. And here you can imagine that this may be something useful, right? Um, is 
the output is already related, uh, obviously with the gradient of the image, but in this image we have sea surface height, and the gradient is related also with height and geostrophic velocities. Uh, so in our example, we are going to try to do the same. We generate uh, 1,000 synthetic um, images of combined sines and cosines, and we compute the Sobel filter for those images, and that's what we are going to use to train the network. So this is the input to the network, and this is the output of the network, which is just the Sobel being applied to those 1,000 images. And in this case, we generate with a PyTorch a single um, filter that has a, a one band as an input, one band as an output, or a single filter. And the size of our filter is going to be three by three. And as I told you before, the number of parameters that that single filter is going to have is going to be 10, three by three for the kernel and one for the bias. And initially, the weights of the model are, are randomly selected, so we don't have anything related with the why This is the input of the network. This is what we want to learn, and this is the current state of our model. And if we iterate the, sorry. If we iterate on the on the learning of the network here, we see how the number of iterations of the network and how it's getting approximated into the um, proper uh, filter, approximated proper filter. So we can. So the end is very similar. And what I want to show you here is that once the network has learned this filter, we can apply it to other data sets. Right? Here, uh, the only thing that we are doing is we use our model with uh, a different image. And here we can see the the output of our model and the true solver that we wanted to learn. But here is applied with a completely different image than the ones that we use for training. Okay. So one last example of uh, CNNs. In this case, let's um, approximate something a little bit more complicated. It's just the combination of the Sobel filters that I was uh, telling you about. And these are the data sets that we are going to use to train the network. Again, this is the input image and this is the output image. Now we won't be able to do it um, with a single um, filter. So what we do is just stack a couple of uh, CNNs with eight filters each one. And here we already see that the input is not so similar. The output is not so similar as the input because we have more nonlinearities, even though the weights of our network are initialized um, mm. randomly. Here is the learning of the network. Again, this uh, you should be able to very easily uh, run those examples in your machine. And you see how the after like 100 epochs, the model is already learned. I didn't mention it, but I'm also adding some noise into the Sobel. That's why the model is already looking kind of better than the, the prediction. Now, if we apply the model that the network has learned into a new image, you see that you can use a learn model with different images like this one. Okay. 
Okay. So those were toys examples of uh, neural networks and CNNs. I just wanted to show you how how the learning works and how the a single CNN layer uh, is computing. So the now the final uh, example of CNNs that I'm going to show you is something more useful. What we are going to try to learn now is to identify the loop current. Here we have a sea surface sky in the Gulf of Mexico. Again, this is Florida and this is Mexico. And we have a method that consider many things related with the sea surface high that can generate the location of the loop current as a binary mask. And this is important because the loop current tells you a lot of the state of the Gulf of Mexico and it can impact uh, because the loop current brings uh, warm water into the um, into other areas depending on of the state of the loop current is how the fishery will be affected or even cured. Uh, and in almost. this case, yes. Uh, this segmentation, you can apply some operation for that or? or you do it by yourself? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I was kidding from my phone. If, if this segmentation... Yeah, so because uh, uh, the, the Mexico Gulf and um, uh, offshore sea ocean, okay? And so if I understood, you try to identify uh, the difference between these two types of water uh doing that that segmentation here uh, uh by yellow yellow curve here mm -hmm. just to identify this two different types of water uh how can you do that segmentation yeah so this segmentation that i'm using to train the network is obtained with a ah, from the, neural, neural the network okay. it's, it's called is using right now a state-of-the-art method that involves, um, basically it, it takes a specific contour, a 17 centimeter contour of the sea surface height. And then it removes uh, other eddies that will have the same contours. Uh, but at the end is a method that is taking into account the specific contours of sea surface height to generate this binary mask. And now we are going to generate a CNN that mimics this method uh, directly from, from the image. Does it make sense? Uh, yes, I, I, I got it. Thank you. Yeah, so it's become really hard, sadly, because um, my microphone didn't work, so I can hear what I say from my microphone, from my headphones. So let's see. Okay, so now we read the data. Again, this data was generated with a method that is not related with machine learning. But what we have is sea surface sky. And we have the loop current binary mask for that uh, sea surface sky. We have 1,000 uh, examples. And then we want to generate a CNN that performs this uh, segmentation automatically. Um, we can try with a single CNN with one year which will be almost a linear or a linear um, filter. Uh, in this case, just a total number of parameters is 26, but this is not a uh, very simple. Uh, let me see if I, for some reason.
So you can see here that the current model, even with the random weights, is giving me a blank uh, image. So let me see what happened here. We just have one single uh, filter for one single filter and one single hidden layer. Okay. Me, because we, we haven't talked about uh, batch normalization, we are just going to remove it. Okay. Uh, I just want to mention that because the output of the, our problem is a binary image in our last layer of the CNN, we want to have the signal function in this case, because the signal function will help us to generate something closer to zeros and ones. So this is the output of a random uh, weights. And then if we start learning. Um, so again, this is when we are using a very simplistic model and the network is not able to, to mimic our problem, but if we increase the nonlinearity, which is that the, the, this boom of deep learning is just increase the number of hidden layers to increase the nonlinearity of our model. Then we can try to approximate with this. Right now we have uh, four hidden layers with eight filters each one. Each filter is a, one of the kernels that I showed you before, like the solver that we were approximating. With random weights, this is what we have. And after the learning, we can see how the models should get um, similar to, to our training data set. So this is a, yeah, it's always dangerous to do live coding. Uh, still, I'm surprised why it's not. Working. Okay, so I'm going to leave it to you. Uh, I'm sure there is a, something simple that I modify, but um, because I have the link at the end, you will, you will be able to run it and you can see how um, this CNN works. Let me spend one minute and see if I find a mistake. Okay, so that was the, the final example where you can use, we can use CNN to do something uh, more real. And now we are going to move into into our presentation, which was how we can do data simulation with convolutional neural networks. And I assume that you've got at least a basic idea of how uh, convolutional neural networks work. Uh, well, the, the funding, that, the research that I'm going to talk about is being funded by the Office of Naval Research, so we thank them for that. And there are many ways you, we can think on how to use machine learning for data simulation. Uh, for this specific research, we are trying to improve the performance of an existing data simulation package using CNNs. Uh, and we want to do it in a realistic uh, uh, set of a, an ocean circulation model of a, let's call it full equation. Mm -hmm. In this, this type of ocean circulation models, they, they provide basically seven variables, which is uh, UV and W uh, for the currents, then the density, pressure, the temperature, and salinity. And the different models 
may have different parameter, parameterizations uh, and implement numerical schemes, etc. But at the end, they are a combination of those um, physical laws that we have for, for the ocean. As it was mentioned before, the problem with these uh, ocean circulation models is that we have some errors associated to them. One may be that numerical scheme that we are using is not uh, perfect. Another one is that the, the grid resolution that we are using in our numerical scheme uh, is finite. So there are some processes that we are not able to solve with, with the size of our grid. Here I'm just showing you some of the processes uh, in the ocean and the, the related uh, spatial scale to those processes. Then we also have some parameterizations on our equation that approximates our solution. And we also don't have the, we also don't have the, we also don't know the precise initial conditions of our model. So that's also uh, one of the errors that we have. And on the other side, Oh, sorry, I'm reading a question here. Is the final output just a matrix with values for pixels? Or... Yes. Uh, yes, from th that was from the previous example, I think. Is the final output just a matrix with values for pixels? That's correct. So coming back to the presentation, then on the other side, we have the observations, ocean observations, and then we have many. Right? We have satellite observations, ships, uh, moorings, drifters, but all these observations, first they are sparse, even though, for example, the satellite will give you a good spatial resolution, that will be only for the surface. So, so we don't have any information on the depth of the ocean. And similarly, we have ships and, and moorings that, that may tell you the temperature and salinity uh, for all the depths, but that will be only for that specific uh, location in space. So we want to use data simulation to improve the, the, the ocean models and we can use those models for, for many things to understand the, the real state of the ocean and also to make forecasts on time. So what we did is to test our CNNs, we defined uh, this uh, test case on the Gulf of Mexico where we run two years of the HICON model. This is a full set HICON model with a hybrid um, coordinates. Uh, the resolution of our model is 125th of degree. And this is just the information of the atmospheric forcing that was used for that specific uh, run. Then the assimilation, now we are coming back to the data assimilation work. The assimilation is happening every day. And the system that is used for doing the assimilation is this one, the tender statistic interpolation system. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, this system. Uh, it's very simple in the sense that it's using optimal interpolation. And if it was, as it was mentioned before, I mean, this uh, method was created, I think on uh, 75. But still, there is always a lag between the state of the art data simulation methods and the ones that are implemented uh, operationally. So, this is this is uses uh, this uh, function that we have seen before, where XB represents the background state, which will be our model being executed from the previous time to the next one. Then we have uh, K or uh, common gain matrix, Y are our observations, H is our observational uh, operator, and XA is the analysis state. So we are going to go into the details of how each matrix is uh, approximated or computed with thesis. Uh, as, as we saw before, this is a, the optimal assuming some things on the model like uh, linearity, etc. This will be the optimal matrix uh, for the Kalman gain. And that's 
That's correct. Optimal interpolation is applied on the high cone model. So that's thesis is already available in Fortran, uh, specifically for HICOM, so you can run thesis with HICOM. Um, so from this equation, we have that P is a error covariance matrix that we don't know if we knew it, then we can solve it easily, but we are going to see how we approximate it. H is the observation operator that we are going to discuss it later. And R is the error covariance matrix of the observation. So this is assumes that uh, the observations are uncorrelated. So R is a diagonal matrix. Then uh, this is approximate speed uh, by, well, first it parameterizes by uh, the multiplication of these two matrices, T and C, which these should be the variances of the um, uh, error of the model, but these variances are approximated from a long run of climatology, right? So we have this uh, same area of the Gulf of Mexico. We generate a run of, let's say, 20 years, and we obtain those, the variances for each field, let's say temperature or uh, SSH, and we use the standard deviation of those variables for that long run as the variances of our model. And then the correlation matrix uh, is considers that, um, again, that the error, the correlation, be, the, the correlation of the error of the model uh, it be, is correlated only or in the surrounding areas, similar to the localization. So what we have is that the correlation metric is approximated by uh, this function, the SOAR model. And we basically, what we have is that each section considers only um, information close to each pixel or each uh, location on the grid. And it is made uh, in such a way that um, that the, the correlation is reduced to zero after around 100, 150 kilometers. And then the, the multivariate correlation is obtained from the equations and or SOAR model. So this is how the correlation between pressure and U uh, will look like, the matrix of that uh, correlation. This is just the specific of how this is is approximating the error uh, covariance matrix P. Finally, H, uh, as we have seen before, it relates the, the background state with the, or it projects the background state to the locations and units of the observations. And in this case for thesis, there are several things that are happening with H. First, uh, HICOM uses three different type of uh, coordinate system. This is C coordinate system where each layer corresponds to a specific uh, depth in the ocean. Then um, uh, raw or isopignic um, layers that will follow the density in the ocean and find out the sigma layers that will follow the bathymetry. And because the observations are on the C uh, coordinates, then the, our operator H needs to map basically the, um, the observations into the grid or the grid into the observations. And also those profiles that do not have information about um, salinity, but they have the temperature uh, information thesis, generates um, a synthetic uh, temperature profile before the assimilation happens. Again, this is just the specific of how TCC is performing the data assimilation process. It first do a temperature and salinity analysis where it assimilates the temperature and salinity profiles. 
uh, all do all is made with the same uh, equations of uh, optimal interpolation. And after that, it performs the sea surface height analysis, where it um, assimilates information of the um, sea surface height on the satellite and the velocities. And then it needs to update the variables of HICOM, which includes the layer thickness on the isopicnic coordinates. And one more thing is that the analysis is separated for each vertical layer. So the analysis is not happening on all the three-dimensional field at the same time. The analysis is performed layer by layer, and then uh, post-processing is uh, required to remove any non-physical uh, results, because at the end, the, the data simulation system does not know the physical constraints. So there is a post-processing uh, section where some um, correction is happening on, on, on for example, uh, removing negative layer thickness that can generate by thesis. So to see how thesis works, here on the upper left, we see HICOM being the ocean model being executed without data simulation. On the upper right, we have the satellite tracks are being assimilated. On the bottom left, we have HICOM with uh, thesis uh, as a simulation method. And then on the bottom right, we have the um, product from Aviso that is an uh, interpolation of the, um, of the satellite tracks, which we can consider as uh, not the true, but yeah, as closer to the true as possible. And we can definitely see that the assimilation uh, run of, of HICOM with thesis is much more closer to the um, product from Aviso than the nature run, or the, the sorry, the um, free run. So we could come back to our test case of two years of uh, running thesis on the Gulf of Mexico, where we assimilate data every day. We are going to test uh, assimilating sea surface temperature, and we are also testing how to assimilate the sea surface height. You can see the, that is uh, very sparse on space, uh, and you can see the tracks of the satellite. And to try to visually relate the, the variables on the equation with the fields that we have, this is, for example, sea surface height, and this will correspond to our background state. This is HICOM alone executed from our previous time step to the next one. Then we have the observations on the previous day in this case. Then we have the innovation, which is just the difference between the observations and the background state and the location of the observations. And then we have the increment. This is what the thesis produces. This is what we want to incorporate into our model uh, to correct. And this is what the network is trying to learn. How can we generate this whole increment by uh, machine learning rather than um, thesis? Is the ocean model uses initialization? Is the ocean model uses initialization procedure after the data simulation process? Uh, so the, the, in the next time step, right? And then once the analysis is generated for the next day, this is what the model uses uh, for the initial conditions, right? So the HICOM, for the next day, HICOM uses the analysis to generate uh, and it evolves uh, one time step only with the numerical schemes of HICOM. And that's what we have as the background step. Uh, I mentioned that because in atmosphere models, after the assimilation, uh, we also apply the initialization procedure in order to remove other um, non-physical uh, information inside of the data. And what do you mean? I don't know if I'm not familiar with ocean modeling, so I ask about. 
And what do you mean for initialization procedure? Uh, initialization procedure is a, a, a kind of method for removing the high frequencies in the initial data. And so we have the initial condition and after the assimilation process or whatever, and so you get your uh, initial condition. And so after that, you apply the initialization. Initialization is try to remove um, uh, high frequencies in the data. That is, uh, it, this is a standard procedure in a, a weather prediction. Mm -hmm. a, as I said, I'm not familiar with ocean, of ocean modern, so I don't know if you apply or not, because you mentioned that uh, you need to remove some non-physical uh, mm -hmm. information. And so I'm, I'm just asking if you apply initialization or not. Yes, so uh, not exactly. And, and I don't, I'm not telling you the details on how the, how the increment is incorporated into the model. But yeah, you are correct. In order to reduce the high frequency waves that are will generate if we uh, add directly the increment, uh, this increment is incorporated into the model in many different time steps. In the sense that at the beginning, the increment is extremely small. And then by, I think, six hours or something like that, is when the whole increment is um, added. But also uh, other research here from our friend Kesha, she's still showing that uh, that assimilation can generate um, internal waves, right? Because of this uh, adding an increment that is not, um, at the end is a step or a sharp increment that will generate waves that will propagate on the ocean. So I think it's um, related with what you are mentioning and how uh, it's made on the atmospheric models. Okay, so we have that idea that we want to use CNNs for mimicking a data simulation system, but uh, when we consider ocean models that are realistic, there are several things that we need to think about it and how to solve it that were not initially considered for CNNs. Like one of those, uh, the first two, like sparse data and land pixels. In an ocean model, land is a non value. But uh, if we look back into our example of CNNs, there is no way to tell them that do not consider um, a pixel in the image. We can add zeros, as I will show you that, that we do it, uh, but that's not exactly the same as telling that uh, that pixel should not be considered. And in fact, in data simulation, we generate a whole uh, one dimensional vector of this uh, array that is not taken into account land pixels. And we also want to know what happened when we input uh, multiple uncorrelated fields. As I, as I mentioned before, CNNs can accept uh, RGB images, but those bands RGB are highly correlated. And in our case, if we want to use multiple inputs at the same time, like SSH and temperature, those may not be uh, highly correlated. So we want to see also how the CNNs will work in that um, case. And finally, the CNN architecture, how complex does the model needs to be in order to mimic the data simulation uh, uh, method properly. So this is just a specific how we did it as uh, we split it or training set. We have two years on uh, training validation and test. And again, this is to decide when to stop the learning, uh, hoping that the generalization will be the best. And here I'm just showing you one specific training of uh, our networks where the orange line is a training error and the blue line is a validation error. And again, this is a more realistic um, 
learning that is not that smooth, but it, it's a good example that uh, it shows you when the learning uh, is stopped, which is when the validation error is the smallest one. And also we need to normalize the, um, the data. Again, we are treating with different fields like temperature and SSH and the range of values are very different. If we do not normalize them, the learning is gonna be slow and also it's going to be directed towards the field that has the largest range. Uh, to start simple, we, we tested only, um, or we started testing a surface field only on 2D. And all these different examples that I'm going to, or experiments that I'm going to show you are trained five times to generate some statistics on, on them. The loss function that we're using is mean square error. And as I mentioned, the training stops when the validation uh, loss function is not uh, reduced after 50 epochs. And this is just the flavor of um, gradient descent that we are using, which is atom of <laughs> All the data that can go as an input to the CNN is the following. We have the SST, which is the background state of our model, SSH again. Then we have the topography. Why? Because in the case of SSH, this is, does not generate increments for uh, shallow areas than 200 meters. This is, this is a thing for thesis, which makes sense because um, because uh, sometimes the observations are not um, are very noisy on those um, shallow areas. So if we want the network to learn that part, we need to provide uh, topography so that it learns that it should not uh, generate uh, increments um, for shallow areas. And then from the observation side, we have the SSH satellite tracks, then the associated errors, and we are helping the network by providing the innovation. So we also incorporate the um, difference between the, the background state and the observations. We also input that as, a, as part of the CNN. And then we also have a SST, the same, same one, the error of the SST. And these are the two increments that thesis will generate. And depending on the experiment that I'm going to show you, this is what we want the network to learn the increment for SSH and then increment for temperature. Mm. Yeah, I don't. Mm -hmm. So we are testing five different things. I'm going to explain uh, each of them. Uh, the total numbers of uh, models that we created are 75. And I'm going to explain you why we tested each, each of those. So the first one is the complexity of the network. We tested uh, basically two different architectures. One that I call simple CNN is just very similar as the last example that I show you, which is just a stack combination, a stack uh, CNN layers with 32 filters. The simplest one, it only has two hidden uh, CNNs. And then we have what we call CNN4, CNN8, and CNN16. And the only thing that is changing between those is the number of hidden layers. You can see here in this table, the number of uh, filters that, uh, and hidden layers that each of the network has. And finally, we are testing another architecture uh, unit. Uh, this one is, uh, I mean, it has been used widely in many different areas. Uh, it incorporates basically two things. One, the, what we call the skip connection, which is represented by these uh, gray lines that um, provides a way to uh, propagate the learning of the weights uh, farther with respect to the, to the input of the network. Here on the left is the input of the network, here on the right is the output. And here you can see how the dimension of the output in each layer is being modified. And the unit also has what is called an encoder and decoder architecture that uh, I, I didn't explain, it. I mean, I didn't give you an example of this, but it's doing two things. Basically, it's, it's abstracting the knowledge by creating a different latent space of, um, 
that does not correspond exactly with the with the same spatial spatial dimensions. But uh, well, I could spend more time explaining what the uh, unit uh, does. But the two main ideas is you have the skip connections, and then the encoded decoder architecture for uh, abstracting knowledge on the encoding part. So here is the results. I'm going to explain this plot because I'm going to show you. Let me show you because I have one question. Says Haroldo. Haroldo asks about the unit. Is each image different fields? Are input treated with independent convolutions? Or all images are grouped as only one large image for convolution processing? Okay, so that's part of the things that we are testing. So we are testing. Uh, they are all, this is a, only a 2D unit, which means that each field, because we are only working with surface fields, each field is treated as a single band of an image, like an RGB image. And that will change depending on the input that we are testing. As I will show you right now, we tested by uh, only using SSH and the SSH error as an input, or also combining uh, temperature and SSH as, as inputs. And when we move to 3D, we could try to, uh, to separate the, the inputs into the unit by field, but that's something that we can test uh, in a future research. Okay, what do we have here? We have uh, each column is a different experiment that we have. It's a different uh, CNN architectures complexity that we are testing. And on Y is the mean square error that we obtain for those five runs on each uh, similar training. And this is nice. We see two things. One is that the more complex networks reduce the error of the model. And one more important thing is that here I'm showing you the error on the test set. So this is only the last two months of the two years, which the network has never seen before. Uh, so it, it does tell us, it does tell you information on how better the performance is going to be for different, uh, for dates outside the, the training set. So most complex, uh, more complex uh, CNNs are getting uh, better results. And the unit, which is, uh, taking into account the skip connections and the encoder decoder is the one that obtains the best results. But I think some things that I want to show you here is that even the simplest model with only two hidden layers uh, is only one order of magnitude uh, higher error than the most uh, complex um, unit architecture. So I think the second thing that we tested is Uh, the window size, but uh, if we recall how the CNN layers, in this case, what I'm talking about, the window size is the, is the initial input of the image. Why? If we train the CNN with the whole domain, we can expect that it will not generalize correctly to a different domain. Why? Because the, the length there are many things that are associated with this specific domain, like the land location. Right? If we train this network with the Gulf of Mexico, we will not expect it to work in any different domain because it will be tightly um, related to the land. So what we did, okay, let's see if we can train the network by randomly selecting areas inside the ocean. Uh, this will uh, it could provide an, a model that it will be much more general, but of course it cannot um, consider or, or take into account the specific location of the model. If I train with the whole domain, the network can learn weights specific, specifically for one uh, location. If I randomly select windows uh, for each example inside the ocean, the network will not be able to learn um, things specifically for each uh, spatial location. I don't know if, if I can explain that correctly. But, uh, so what we test 
method it was exactly that, right? We can use the whole domain for input, or we can um, randomly select windows of different sizes inside our domain. Uh, and these are the different sizes that we test. And this is what we obtain. There is a clear relationship between the size of the window that we are using with the performance of the network. And most importantly, when we use the whole domain is when we obtain the best result. That's correct. The inputs of the network are the observations and the background. These are the input fields, uh, SSH and the error or the, um, well, yeah, I'm not putting you all the, the inputs here. Is the SSH, is the topography, is the SSH uh, error, the, the, uh, the error observations, and also the, the innovation, which is the difference between the background state and the SSH. All those four goes as input into the network and the output is the increment. It, it's, the output of the network is the increment of the model. So if we go back a little bit, the output of the network is something like this. Is the increment uh, of, the, of the system, which is if we wanted to relate it to the data simulation, is all this, all this term is what we want the network to learn. Okay. Yeah. They... Okay, so, so what we see here is that larger, the, the network performs better with, uh, with the, when we train with the whole domain, which is telling us that the network is definitely taking into account the position of the pixels, uh, but at the same time, we can expect that the model will not work better, will not work correctly in a different domain outside the Gulf of Mexico. If we wanted to uh, to, to obtain, a, to replace that simulation system. In that case, we will need to train for that specific uh, grid. Another th thing that we tested is the output field, right? And the output field, again, is a, a increment that we want to learn. Uh, we want to see what happens if we train the network to obtain the SSH increment alone, which is what I'm showing you before or if the network can predict the two increments at the same time, SSH and SST, and also uh, when we want the network to predict uh, SST increment. Of course, in this case, we need to input the background state of SST together with uh, SST observation. Right? We cannot expect the network to be able to predict SST increment if we do not input the uh, temperature observations um, into the network. And this is a result that we have. Of course, we can only compare um, these two. Here I'm showing you the uh, RMS error for only the SSH output, which is in meters. And here the, the error when we output the temperature increment, which is in Celsius. Uh, here, what we what the, this result is telling us is that the network is uh, complex enough to obtain the same results when we predict the increment of temperature and SSH both at the same time. Okay. This is the, the, the performance is not reduced. Uh, here's the final test I think that I want to show you is uh, we wanted to see if the land pixels that right now in all the previous examples that I'm showing you, they were replaced by zero, uh, could affect the learning of the network some way. So what we did is we enforced the training examples to have a specific percentage of ocean in the image. In this case, we cannot train with a whole domain. If we train with a whole domain, then we cannot change that. Right? Every time 
Every single training example is a whole domain. If we train with the window sizes, uh, with the smaller windows of size 100 by 100, 160 by 160, then we can decide if that random example that we selected, uh, if we zero percent means, means there is no restriction. Any random window can will be used for training. Ninety percent of ocean means that only those windows randomly selected that contains at least ninety percent of the ocean will be used to train the network. Okay, and in that case, it's not a clear tendency. Uh, we do see a, a slight improvement when we train with windows that consider only 90, at least 90% of the ocean. So we have one more question. Unit is a supervised neural network, which is a reference data for the learning phase. The reference data. So yeah, what we're using, what we are used to train is the first, uh, for those two years where we uh, have a high column run with pieces being assimilated, for every single day where we assimilate data, we say the previous, uh, the background state of the model, and then the increment of thesis. And, and that's what we are used to train the network. That's, that's the, the input to the network. That's what we want to learn. So here is not a clear tendency. Again, this was just an interesting experiment to see what happens with the land uh, pixels, uh, but, but it's not a, a clear uh, result. And finally, uh, here we evaluate how the performance of the CNN gets affected by modifying the input fields. The first one is when we only input SSH observations. And uh, of course, every time we also input in the background state. The only thing that we are modifying is if we also, additionally, we input the, um, the, the innovation, uh, no, sorry, the SSH uh, error on the observations. And what happened if we include additional information like SSD? And even more when we incorporate all this information, SST, SSH error, SST error, and innovation into the network. Uh, all just to predict SSH increment in this case. And what we see is that, um, which is expected also because this is does take into account the error on the observations to make the analysis. So the CNN performs a little bit better when we incorporate that information as input, which is the, the SSH error on the observations is performing a little bit better. So that's it. Uh, from all those experiments, if we obtain our best model, which is the one that I'm showing you here, those options, this is a snapshot of what we will obtain. This is an increment of SSH generated by thesis. This is an increment of uh, SSH generated by the CNN, and this is a room mean square error. So you can see that the whole, the overall patterns are very good, and the, the mean square error, uh, the root mean square error is around uh, four millimeters for the whole test data set. Here, I'm showing you the same, the mean root mean square error for all the days on the test set. Still, we need to investigate what happened on, on those days where the errors are large, but you can see that uh, they only go from four uh, millimeters to six millimeters. And this is again, the error obtained on the test days. And here I'm just showing you uh, visually the results of those uh, examples. Again, those examples were not used for training or for validation, but, uh, but I, again, I, I'm going to show you that I'm going to discuss how, uh, how, uh, 
how true is that information that the network is going to be able to generalize to other dates. Uh, similarly, here are the results for SST. Again, the overall patterns and values are very similar, but we do get, um, sometimes we do get errors uh, close to the coast. First, because the increment is already large on SST. And second, because as mentioned before, CNNs do not, not really know what to do close to the land. For, it. for the CNN, these are just zero values. So it may not be so easy for the CNN to represent high values close to them, to land. Yes, I'm going to discuss the CPU time right now. Uh, so yeah, so these are the results for the, I have still 10 minutes. Let me go to the comparison of the computational time. These are the results for SST and you can see the error is around uh, uh, one tenth of the degree. But in general, the patterns are, are very uh, similar. And just, I want to mention here the, the generalization thing. The two years that we evaluated were 2009 and 2010, but it was mentioned in, in another presentation, which is true, that the test dates, which are just the last two months of those uh, two years, the state of the ocean may be very similar to the training uh, examples, but the network may not work correctly on states of the Gulf of Mexico that are very different. So in order to test that, we did a, a two, we run a high with thesis for two different years where we tried to find years with different um, Gulf of Mexico states. And in 2002, the loop current is um, uh, what they call it, like uh, not elongated. It's not producing uh, eddies most of the year. And in 2006, you can see how uh, the loop current is extended and it sheds different uh, multiple eddies in that year. And you can see that the model still the error is a little bit higher than the test uh, dates. It's around 0 0.06, 0 0.06 uh, or six millimeters. But, uh, but this is a nice uh, generalization test of the model. Right? There are two very different years with different states of the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, they do not correspond with the years where the network was trained to mimic a thesis. Uh, one more question. From Vinicius, let me see. Are these results only a difference of analysis and observations? That error, that difference is between the increment of the data simulation method, which is thesis, and the increment produced by the network day by day. Yeah, I'm not considering any difference between the observation per se and the forecast, because the observations, they all also uh, have, uh, uh, yeah, we could do something like that to test the error exactly with the observations. <laughs> that will be another option. The question. So here I'm showing you for, for those two years that uh, are very different than the training scenario. And finally, we uh, come back to the initial idea was to improve the performance of the data simulation system, right? So how long does this take to do the data simulation part? This is, again, it's a very simple model. Uh, to start with, we don't have an example. Uh, the time that takes for thesis to run the assimilation for four fields on all the depths are 21 seconds on uh, HPC here at Ferris State University for 32 processors and only eight seconds on 96 processors on the cluster on the Navy. So because we are only doing the data simulation on the surface, uh, again, this is, this is a preliminary results. Then we have like a, two different options. The, the worst option is assume that when we do the data simulation for all the four fields and all the um, day players, uh, we will do it sequentially in the sense that we will multiply the time that takes 
uh, or CNN to run, the unit, which is the one that is obtaining the best results, takes uh, points of 0 0.042 seconds uh, to run a, a single data simulation. And if we assume that that will have to be uh, added sequentially, uh, we will need to multiply that time for the whole 30 uh, layers on depth and the four fields that we are going to compute. And that will give us around five seconds to compute the data simulation in the CNN. And in that case, we will only get a speed up between one and four. But that's like the worst case estimate because we know that the GPU uh, for this problem, for this problem we are using, and uh, this is the GPU that we're using, the Quadro. It's not a very big uh, GPU, but it's not a small either. But the whole uh, cores and memory of the GPU is not used completely, which means that we could run in parallel more than a single field. And if we assume the best case scenario where we can process in parallel all these depth layers and the four fields, in that case, then we will obtain a speed up between uh, uh, 200 and 500. Again, the comparison is not straightforward because one thing is running on the HPC on the cluster and the other one is running on a GPU, which has many more cores, but there are smaller cores and, and many more, yeah, much more smaller cores. So again, it's still, uh, it's interesting this result. We can definitely obtain some speed up with the CNN. Uh, the results are similar. And if we were mimicking a more uh, computationally expensive data simulation package, assuming that we can still do it with a CNN with similar complexity, that uh, improving performance could be even um, larger. So just as a summary, I give you, I try to give you a parsing for your neural network, conversion neural network, and then I show you our preliminary results on how to mimic a data simulation method, in this case, optimal interpolation in a, a full set ocean circulation model that is used operationally uh, for other centers. Uh, and how can uh, CNNs are able to improve their performance? There are many things that we can still do. First, the models that I'm showing you right now do not provide any uncertainty. Uh, uh, maybe training uh, Bayesian CNNs will help us to uh, tell us where, where should we leave, where should we believe the, the output of the CNN. Uh, and still incorporating the CNN into the data simulation pipeline of our operational ocean circulation model still has some uh, technical challenges. Again, because current uh, models are executed in Fortran in a, in a cluster, but the CNNs are normally executed in the, in the GPUs. So we will need to find a way to incorporate that execution, execution in the pipeline. Uh, that's everything. Thank you. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer. All right. Thank you. Thank you a lot, uh, Dr. Omo. I already addressed some, uh, some, uh, some questions to you by chat. And uh, uh, very good job. I, I, I enjoy your results. In particular, with, with this, this um, application of subdomains in uh, try to identify uh, the performance from the, from the data uh, neural network using the whole domain and, um, and using different windows. That's, um, that's very good. That's very good. I think that's one smart, smart idea. I enjoy it. Thank you. Um, uh, there is, um, uh, let, let me see if there is, I don't know if there is other, other comments or questions here in the, the chat. Yes, I think I tried to answer those. Yeah, but, but uh, basically uh, when you, uh, uh, I, I, I asked something about the CPU time uh, for the, uh, for the, um, for, but I, I'm not considering the, the, the learning phase, just uh, when you try to get the analysis. Uh, how about the um, uh, STIS 
uh, schemes to producing the analysis and how about the, uh, okay. Yeah, so the, yeah, right. I mean, here I'm not putting uh, any time about the training. Uh, with all the training, it's not that large in this uh, case. Uh, each single example of the 75 experiments that we did, it takes around two to three hours to do the training. Of course, all those experiments, we were investigating the behavior of the CNN. Uh, once you come up with a proper model that, uh, that is going to work, it will take you um, a couple of days. Again, we only train with less than two years of data. Uh, and we do see that even though it generalizes uh, some sort of good to years with a different state of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, I definitely suggest that the training should uh, be on more years. And more importantly, you want to do the training with examples that are different uh, with each other, right? It's not useful to train for 10 years where the state of the Gulf of Mexico is exactly the same. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so you, we, want, we always want to try to find examples that will be a good representation of the whole uh, domain. Again, All right, but, okay, and then, and then uh, for example, for this domain in the, the Mexico Gulf, uh, uh, for when you compute uh, the, the CPU time for the each uh, data simulation cycle for HICON, um, in terms of CPU time, uh, and, uh, and um, when you using the, TST, TSIS mean, and uh, I mean, and uh, and uh, and uh, neural network. Uh, which is the the difference between the CPU time of these two methods for each uh, each uh, data simulation cycle? Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't have it for the CNN, correct? Because okay, again the the CNN. I mean, even though we could. This, uh, uh, for example, this, uh -huh. this uh, 21 the seconds processor. means I mean, two, uh, 32 processors for the Hikon. Yes, 32 process, 21 second for a single uh, assimilation. Cycle. Using neural network. Using neural network is this one. Okay, and for, and for the TI, TSIS, 21 seconds in 32 processors, a second in 96 processors. But yeah, this but is when you yeah when you consider, for example, the, the same four fields, but using TSIS, the analysis. Yeah, so this the is same. how people is using the four fields and all the C levels. Okay. But the CNN that we created is right now only tested with a single layer on the surface. Okay, five five seconds. Yeah, that's why it, we cannot compare right now because the CNN does not perform the analysis on the whole uh, domain four fields on the high comp and also the depth layers. So we can uh -huh. just estimate how long it's going to take. If we assume that it's going to take uh, the time is going to be add up in the sense that it will take the same time for each layer to compute the analysis with the CNN, it will take up to five seconds. But that's not real in the sense that we can easily generate a CNN that computes the whole volume, for example, at the same time. Uh, so the best estimate is we assume that it's that the CNA that produces the increment for the whole four fields and all the dev layers is, is run completely on parallel. In that case, you will get a speed up uh, of around 193 or 500. Again, this, it also depends on how many processors you are using to run Python. Okay, thank you. Uh, someone else? Uh, address some question or comments for Dr. Olmo? If not, 
uh, I'm going to say thank you again for accept our invitation and thank you for this very interesting